Right, we're back again now. What we're going to do before we move on to some new material, I, uh, Lloyd has asked that we do a addendum to the last episode on obligatory lying. Because one of the comebacks that we're getting from you uh, who are watching, and I thank you for that, so thank you that you are responding, is that this idea of... Uh, a, Every, for every the, the idea that there are certain laws that seem to contradict Sharia law and that these are being practiced by Muslims in different places and in different periods, that seems to obviate a strict Sharia understanding. How is this possible? So what he wants and what uh, what Lloyd wants to do today is he wants to then uh, show, well, wait a minute, there are cultural differences that are acceptable. So I'm going to give it over to him. Lloyd, thanks so much for coming on board to help us with this problem here. It, when you go to different countries, you see different laws, you see that they seem to be contradictory, and they don't seem to be part of the manuals, the manuals that we have. How do you explain that and what's going on here? And what do you mean by cultural differences? Over to you. Yeah. Before we pause on that, in what sense are they contradictory? Just, just define that, Jay, because how are they supposed to be contradictory? Contradictory to the Quran, contradictory to the Hadith, because they contradict each other. Contradictory anyway, to so. the manuals themselves, and so you have you have certain you have certain people who do laws as you as you said many many times. You have a law here, but there are many ways to to uh, go get. You don't have to hold that's that. That's There are many that's out, which allows. Me. And so there, you know, for every law there is, there is a unlaw or there is an uh, uh, opposite to it that can be still be practiced. That's confusing. And except no no, they are these are legal rules so, so they are legal loopholes and legal exceptions to all of them hiyal is the method to to break any of these laws to create a loophole for it i think what's confusing a lot of people is you've said a number of times here is the law however many people break it and that's perfectly okay for them to break it i think that's what's confusing people if it's a law yeah I'm well it, it, look uh, unfortunately that's just how it is it's it's i didn't write these laws i didn't I'm just stating this is how it is. This is how it works. It, it, this is how it is. We just, you see, it, it's not Christianity with beards and funny dresses. It's a completely different culture. It doesn't think like us. It, it, it has thrown logos out the window. It relies on will. It relies on deception. It is built around deception. It is built around will, getting your way no matter what. And the Sharia states, the end justifies the means. And, and this is part and parcel of how Islam is built. It's within the Sharia. Okay. And this is something that we, that another came up and we mentioned just quickly, and that is the cultural differences in every, there are cultural differences between Indonesia, cultural differences between Morocco, uh, what we see in the Middle East, what we see in North Africa, what we see in Pakistan. These are also incorporated by different chefs or different peers or different marabouts if you're in north yeah. africa how do you explain these cultural differences yet they still are sharia to me that uh, and i guess a number of also people are saying this is contradictory so we will be covering that within specific detail as we go through the slideshow so i just wanted to introduce this very briefly without going to too much depth now but i will be going into specific depth covering again as i've spoken about ikhtilaf which is the doctrine of difference which is considered a mercy from Allah. So in other words, not everyone has the same insight, the same level of knowledge or the same ability. Therefore, they can do as much as they can do. And your ability might not be that of someone else. So he will do different or more or something. In fact, which might be completely opposite because that is covered by another set of doctrines I've discussed before called Azima and Ruhsa, strictness. So your Salafis, these are strict Muslims. Then you have Ruhsa. So you might say, well, he's not a practicing Muslim. Well, that's because he's practicing the doctrine of Ruhsa, leniency. He's not doing it because that's the best he can do. He's a lazy man, for argument's sake. And then he gets reward for that because he's following doctrine to the letter. And the Salafi who practices Azima, who's being strict, he gets more reward because he's following the doctrine even more strictly, but they're both following doctrine. So, but I wanted to, let me share my screen here and just... Uh, briefly, I want to show this. It has come up, especially when discussing honor killing, which is mentioned within Islamic law. We covered that within the legal homicide or permissible homicide within Islamic law. 
which was obviously it stated that you can kill a non-Muslim if you're a Muslim without penalty. You can kill women and children without penalty. You can kill apostates without penalty. And a father can kill his children or grandparents can kill their grandchildren without penalty. We showed that. But I want you to notice that this is the five normative maxims of Islamic law. Now, you can go to any number of books on the topic. I've posted on my community tab, for instance, a couple of books on this as well. So, but you're free to look these up. Look up the, the maxims of Islamic law. Notice this rule here, the fourth one. Cultural usage shall have the weight of law. Hmm. So Muslims will say, that's not Islam, that's culture. The problem for Islam and within the Islamic law is that if it is culture, it is Islam. It has been absorbed into the Islamic law. So this is something that is part and parcel of the culture, and thus it now becomes considered lawful. Now, notice here, though, there's a couple of these other rules here. Acts are judged by the intention. So the act is not done judged by what you did. Did you kill women and children? Well, did you do it for the good of Allah? Yes, I did it for the good of Allah. Okay, that's fine. That is what acts are judged by the intention. That is a very clear implication of that. We'll come into that as we discuss in the Sharia as well. Harm must be eliminated. Define harm. What is harm? What I am doing is harm. If you look at, for instance, Samuel Petit, he harmed Allah. He harmed Islam. He was beheaded for that because harm must be eliminated. Certainty is not overruled by doubt. And notice the last one. Hardship begets facility. If you're having a tough time, well, you can break all of the Islamic laws because you're having a tough time. So facility means lenience. So for undefined cases of hardship, you can use facility. Your thoughts, Jay? I'm just looking at this and pretty much if these five are uh, applied, pretty much anybody can do anything they want and apply to one of these or the other hardship. My goodness, that is applied all the time by people who get caught here in the West. They say, I had to do it because of my background, because of the way I was brought up, because of the fact that I'm poor, because of the fact that I, I, uh, someone yelled at me and I, you know, I'm because I'm, you, you name it, they give an excuse for it. If that is the case, how do you, how do you have any laws? To me, this opens up an enormous amount of like a Pandora's box. It just opens up anybody saying anything and using almost any one of these five to obviate having to step to follow a specific law that is applied there in one of the manuals. So can you understand the minefield that is Islamic law and Islamic yeah. thinking? Right. Now, I want to mention one or two small things. This is from Usul al-Fiqh. For the Muslim who is not a mujtahid, there are any number of books. This is from the Essential Studies in Islam series by a sheikh. And he tells us, right, reward and punishment is determined by the intention. A person does a haram act without intending it will not be punished. A person who does an illegal action in Islam who did not intend to do it will not be punished. Now, of course, we know that within Western law, if you don't intend to kill someone, you still killed them, you are punishable, you, are, you may be punished, you are liable for that crime. Whereas in Islamic law, notice, we've just seen this, this is in this little simple book for non for non mujtahids non legal scholars. We've just got this here, we've just seen this it acts are judged by the intention. And here we've got confirmation of this. And we've seen this within the other Sharia rules I've been through before. But again, here's another reward and punishment is determined by intention. Not by the action. We've discussed that before. Uh, your thoughts on that, Jay? Interestingly, if this is the case, then in, we have in the West different gradations of punishment. So you have first degree, second degree, third degree, and something like a, this would sound like a third degree that they didn't intend it. They accidentally uh, they threw something at somebody in anger and it killed the person by accident. That would be third degree. It wouldn't be intended. So this is similar to what we're talking about. And I'm assuming that's what you're saying here. Well, we've covered this for more serious crimes. We discussed this in relation to when we spoke of legal permissible homicide. If you kill women and children, then it's okay. There's no fine. You're not liable to pay a fine. It's not, it's a crime. You should go to prison. Oh, there's no fine for that. It's like a parking ticket. No, I'm talking your about intention was here. Good. You yeah. still, you still intended to kill the women and children. What about if you kill somebody by accident, like you, you were driving recklessly and you hit somebody uh, on the road, that was not an intentional, it was an accidental, uh, it was accident, that would be stipulated by this law. That's what, the, there's where this would come in. 
uh, there would be other things as well in terms of well, what is haram. There's a very broad range of what could be considered haram. So in other words, you can break a rule without intending it. So maybe, maybe you deny a lot because you're talking to some Christians on a YouTube comment forum and you, you deny certain things, but you see, you, you didn't intend to, but you had this need. So, because the action is determined by the intention, the intention was to defend Islam by, I don't know, breaking some sort of rule. So understand that it's just the, the ramifications of this are so broad, mm. but yeah. just something to think about and notice this, there is no rebuke on issues of ijtihad. When a person does an action in a religion that is based on valid ijtihad, it is impermissible for anybody to level an accusation or criticize him for it. So yeah, Muslims who do things that can be found to be within Islamic law are not blameworthy because this is the subject of a valid ijtihad. So it's a subject of a valid ruling within the Islamic law. And then aside from that, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that people have been saying. This is Brian Doyle, who claims to be an atheist, who always at the critical moment defends Islam and criticizes Christianity only. He only comments on Christian channels, I only say. attacks Christianity. I think he's a Muslim undercover of an atheist. I think that's what he says. I think so too. I've, I've called him that for two years now. Notice he says here, this is on, on the subject we just did on murder in Islam, like murder for apostasy. Since murder is subjective, conditional on individual cultures, there is no rational discussion for murder. This is the logic we're applying here. <clears throat> and uh, of course, then we've got Bahada Ai telling us, Lloyd, there is no such thing like Shahada. The Shahada doesn't exist because I asked him to show me the full Shahada in the Quran. And he says, there's no Shahada. Then, of course, we have this guy who's telling us, I can prove that Muhammad never married because I explained to him about Muhammad and Aisha. He says, no, Muhammad never married. In fact, there's another quote he sent me. Muhammad never married someone called Aisha. They were never married. Then he can prove that lies two people in the names of Jibril and Mikhail. This is the kind of thing that you get. Sunni Islamic doctrine is not Islamic because I showed him stuff in the Sharia. So Sunni Islamic doctrine, they will say literally anything. So I'll, I'll just stop there. I just wanted to show people these things. This is the kind of things people will they'll literally say anything to change the subject, to confuse the issue. Yeah, and I, and, would, I would spend too yeah. much time on those. But these other yeah. ones, I mean, going back, go back to uh, the, the one by the atheist that you said um, is, is yeah. really a Muslim undercover of atheists. I, let's, let's unpack that just a bit. Brian Doyle. Since murder is subjective, it, and then the condition or on the individual cultures, there is no rational discussion for murder. Let me just let me just play the devil's advocate on this and just ask: Is that not what you're saying earlier? That it depends on the cultural usage. If the cultural usage in one case, uh, in in one culture, is that you can, if you are murdering anybody who's not part of your tribe, that's perfectly legitimate. Mm -hmm. That, that is even more specific than a believer because the other tribes are all believers, but you have in, in, in places like uh, in West Africa, where I spent for five years, it really comes down to what tribe you're, you're in. And if you try to murder someone from another tribe, their law is not at all permissible. You do not get incarcerated for that if you murder someone from your own tribe, even if they're mis Muslim. So there is yeah. a West African cr uh, cultural criteria that would not be acceptable here in the West, or certainly would not be acceptable in the Middle East or in any other Muslim context. So is it is subjective depending on the culture. That could cause all kinds of problems because you cannot then dictate what that law is from any manual that is from the 9th to our 11th or 12th or 13th century because it is sub, it is it is uh, uh, it, it is very conditional to that one culture. These are problems that a lot of a lot of Muslims do have. A lot of the, the hearers and people who are watching what you're saying, they love what you're saying, by the way. Some of them are questioning the idea of cultural usages because cultural usages can be almost anything. There are so many different examples of it. We give the example in London where we have the Somali community that are cutting off the hands of those in the community who have stolen. And your Pakistanis and your Indian Muslims who are in the same city are embarrassed when this gets in the news because they say, no, no, this is not true Islam. What they're doing is not, is not at all uh, 
applicable to real Islam, that we are very peaceful. And they're trying to push a peaceful narrative, whereas the Somalis are saying, no, it's right there in Sharia law. It's right there in the manuals. It's also there in the Quran in chapter 5, verse 38. So they have scripture supporting them. The Pakistanis and the Indians living in London do not. And there's an example of where usage can, can obviate. Now, how do you, I, I mean, this has been a good, this has been a good discussion, but in that kind of context, how do you understand that? And how would you come to a conclusion on that? So you've got these people from Africa who are operating according to strictness, to Azima. You've got the Pakistanis operating according to leniency. They're holding back. That's the Rukhsa. However, if we're going to ask those Pakistanis, can you show me within the Islamic law books that you would follow if this were a caliphate, if you go to the books that your imams study when they go to seminary, when they go to university and they study for five to seven years to become an imam, these are the books they read. Can you show me what your rulings are on theft? If this were a caliphate, what would you be doing? And those books will state, chop off their hands. Mm -hmm. There are no other rules. They might be hold them in abeyance for now. Because also you mentioned it embarrasses the Pakistanis, it embarrasses the deen. And Muslims must refrain from doing what is embarrassing to the deen. The Somalis are simply going with what is to them stricter because also culturally they are, this is a cultural practice that they're following because they are, shall we say, more tribal. They are slightly more, they're closer to the bone, let's say, than the more westernized Pakistanis. And also if, if these things were different, they would simply say, well, here, look at this Sharia law that says the following. Let's go to page five of this book. Let's go to page 10. Let's look at rule three, page seven, section nine. They're not doing that. They cannot. We've had literally thousands. We've had several thousand comments now. I've been showing law after law after law, right? Detailed rulings from the greatest scholars of Islam to ever live. These are the books that these scholars study at university. This is what they teach. These are the only books that exist. Not a single Muslim has taken the time to say, Lloyd, well, on that ruling that you showed, all these horrible rulings about beheadings and amputations and, you know, abusing infants, uh, if you go to page three, you know, section seven, it actually says something different. No, they haven't, because it, there is no section seven, page three that says anything different. They all say the same. Why are they not going to those books and saying, hold on, but this is the new updated law for 2022, because there is no such thing. Okay, so we do have two things in contradiction here, which is going to be a problem that we're always going to have, and that is you have the manuals with all their jurisdictions, which Lloyd has been showing us and giving us one after another, one after another. One of the frustrations many of you have uh, is that uh, you can sit there, and as Lloyd gave a few examples of people who are just mouthing off and sounding off, you can do that, but that's not answering what Lloyd's at showing. Lloyd is actually going and putting it verbatim, he's giving you chapter and verse, chapter and verse. He's giving you even the page number, proving that these do exist. If you're going to come back at Lloyd, for heaven's sakes, give chapter and verse. Show from the manual yeah. where he is wrong. Maybe his interpretation is wrong, but it's still there written in black and white. That, And if you can show that his interpretation is wrong on that that, juris, that certain jurisdiction, then fine. Let's, then we can have a discussion. Yeah. The other problem is this, and that is what he's brought up in this in this episode, and that is the problem of cultural the cultural usage. Different cultures use it different ways. In the example that I gave in London with the Somalis versus the Pakistanis and the Indians, that's cultural difference. But it turns out it's not cultural difference. Actually, the ones who really have the authority on this issue would be those who use chapter and verse, as the Somalis are doing. They are going to chapter and verse. They're going and showing, this is what scripture says, this is what Sharia says, this is what the traditions say. They all agree on this point. You steal, you get your hand cut off. So you can see why Lloyd is bringing these down. That's why he's quoting it. That's why he's opening it up. He's, he's actually putting it on screen so you can read it for yourself. He's not making this up. So for those of you who are who do want to have a comeback on it, please do come back. But please start putting down chapter at first so we can see where is it that you think Lloyd has either misunderstood or that he is misquoting it. If in each case, right. we will certainly listen to you and we'll go from there. Nonetheless, we now need to move on. We have other subjects to hit and I'm gonna bring this one episode to a close. Thanks so much, Lloyd, for coming. It's been Thank great you. having you on board. Until Appreciate next it. time, this is Lloyd and Jay, thousands of miles apart, over and out.